thank you very much for introduction of my talk. Uh, my name is Alexandra Dmitrienko. I am uh, from Fraunhofer Institute for Secure Information Technology from Darmstadt. And I am going to present you our work about a key to share framework, uh, which is about using smartphones uh, with NFC for access control. Um, this is a joint work with several partners. Our partners are Technical University Darmstadt, Center for Advanced Security Research in Darmstadt, and Bosch uh, Security Systems in Munich. So I would like to start my talk with uh, motivation. Uh, all we know that modern mobile phones, they provide us many, uh, uh, a lot of computational power and rich uh, communication interfaces and we use them in our daily life very often. We listen to music, we play games, we uh, download applications, we use them for private life and for business and if we forgot, forget our phone at home, we are going to miss it, right? Who has ever forgotten his phone at home? Who didn't miss the phone during the day? Oh, there is a, okay, one and a half person. <laughs> yeah, so this is the thing. Uh, usually mobile phones are always with us. And uh, if we put so many tasks on mobile phone, why not to put just one more? Um, so there are hundreds of thousands of applications on the markets and new interfaces like NFC, near field communication, open new business cases. The main business cases before for NFC were payments and ticketing. And uh, then we asked ourselves, why not using smartphone as a key? If we have the smartphone with us already, why not to get off rid of this? Yeah. So why not to put all these keys in electronic form in the device? And then we have it with us anyway. We can use our smartphone for access control. So a smartphone as a key can be used in many application scenarios. I just briefly go through some of them. Of course, access control to the doors, like uh, the company can manage access control to offices and buildings, access control to the hotel rooms, uh, access control in private sectors to get access to the house or the, to the garage. Uh, smartphone as a key for storage facilities like uh, um, the safe in the hotel, uh, the lockers in the uh, luggage store in the trade station, or DHL pack stations. So you, the post office can just the postman can deliver the package to the packing station, leave it for you, and you pick it up later on. And another case is smartphone as a car key, uh, and an automotive scenario when smartphones are are used as a key, they uh, enable very flexible use cases like fleet management by enterprises, uh, car sharing by rental or car sharing companies, or it just allows the user to share access control, uh, access rights to the car with his friends or family members. So what are the advantages of electronic keys compared to usual keys or smart cards which are also uh, used in today's systems. So one of the big advantages is flexible distribution because when I want to give usual key to someone, we have to meet physically, right? And uh, the same with smart cards. But uh, with electronic keys, I can just issue it uh, and uh, the, the person whom I want to grant access can download it on his mobile phone and uh, it can be done remotely. Uh, another uh, parameter is revocation. So usually if uh, the normal key gets stolen, then you would need to replace the lock. And this is not necessary with smart cards and uh, electronic keys because access can be revoked remotely. Just issue command to the lock to revoke access and then uh, this user with this mobile device will not get access to this door. A uh, distinguished feature of electronic keys is possibility to delegate access rights. And this is why we call actually our application key to share, because we can share our keys. If I have access, I can give access rights to somebody else. And this is not possible with any other solution which I used before, like uh, usual keys or smart cards. 
and uh, electronic keys can be bound to access control policies which specify uh, how long the key can be valid, how many times, and in which time frame. So when we designed our system, we uh, specified some requirements and one of the major requirements we had is security because of course uh, when we have our keys uh, stored in a mobile device, security issues are very important because as soon as we have them electronically stored in the device, there will be adversary trying to steal them. Yeah. So we want to take care of that system is secure, that it is not that easy for the attacker to uh, uh, get an authorized access. Uh, another uh, challenge was for us uh, is performance in face of limited NFC bandwidth. We know that bandwidth of, of, of NFC is like 100 kilobit per second, but it is on physical layer, but on upper layers it is usually much less. So we could get a maximum 10 kilobit per second when we transfer data, and uh, this limitation makes it impossible to use public key cryptography, so uh, it means that all authentication schemes we used uh, to authenticate the device against the log have to rely on symmetric cryptography. Uh, another requirement is we wanted to have offline authentication. It means that we didn't want uh, the user or the log to uh, contact any other third party somewhere in the internet to ask if access can be granted because uh, such a system would may uh, would uh, result in some denial of service uh, um, cases. So if there is no internet, the user would not be able to get to the office, which is not good. So one of the major requirements was offline authentication. So neither the door nor the user need uh, the access to the internet. So this slide shows a system model for our key to share and one of the uh, actually main entity here is so-called issuer. Issuer is a party who set up access control rights in the system. In different scenarios it can be uh, for instance, in enterprise scenario, it can be enterprise who says uh, which employee gets access to which d office. Or in the car or automotive scenario, it could be a car manufacturer who uh, uh, issues the keys for the cars for the end users. And the first step the issuer does uh, uh, it gets relations to some users, so it, it employs employers or sell the car to the users. And after this is done, the users have to perform one-time registration on the key to share serv web service, which is managed by the issuer. Uh, and after one-time registration is done, the application and the mobile device is personalized and then the user can download electronic keys into his mobile device. After keys are there, they, are, they can be used to access resources, doors, cars. And uh, also uh, rights can be delegated to another user, we call delegated user. And the delegated user doesn't have to be registered before in the central server. And when the delegated user gets the key, he can also access the, the resources. So this is like general um, overview scheme, uh, system overview, how the, what parties are involved and how they communicate with each other. And the next, I would like to talk about security. So. We consider two major uh, aspects of security. First aspect is platform security, how to protect uh, cryptographic keys which are used in the protocols uh, securely on the platform. And another aspect was uh, protocol security, how to transfer keys, uh, how to protect them from being intercepted in transit yeah? when they are downloaded, for example, from the server on the mobile device. So this slide shows uh, the security architecture for the platform. Generally here 
we split the execution environment of mobile device into two parts. Here we have untrusted host and trusted execution environment. And untrusted host uh, can have all the code usually which we typically have on a mobile platform. We can uh, put here games which can be potentially malicious and so on. And the trusted execution environment runs only verified and trusted code. Uh, so our key to share application is split into two parts. Here we have the main application which runs in the untrusted host and it provides main functionality, user interface, uh, where the user can navigate through activities and uh, uh, start uh, different use cases. And there is another small uh, counterpart, which we call uh, key to share secure app, and it runs in the trusted execution environment, and it handles security sensitive operations like uh, encryption, decryption, uh, signature, signature verification, and so on. Also, trusted execution environment includes secure storage where cryptographic keys can be stored securely, and it uh, provides, also requires to have secure user interface to handle security sensitive input. For instance, uh, if we want the user to give the pin to verify that the valid user wants to access the resource, this input should be uh, handled also in isolation from the rest of the code because once intercepted it can be misused, right? And there are components like uh, the EE service and the re manager which uh, handle the communication between two worlds. So, the main question is, this is theory, how to bring this theory in practice. How this uh, security architecture can be instantiated, uh, particularly on Android. There are two options we have. We have uh, options to realize this in software or in hardware. And the software, one could uh, go for the solution which uses virtualization on the platform and provides two isolated compartments, one for trusted code, another one for untrusted. Uh, full virtualization can be uh, achieved when we use, uh, for instance, OKL4 hypervisor, right? Uh, another approach is more lightweight, is provided by kernel level virtualization like vServer solution. Or there are also solutions which provide lightweight OS-based isolation, like Bistrust, and I will talk about Bistrust later on. So there are several options in hardware, particularly in Android. We have several options to get trusted execution environment and hardware. The first option is uh, uh, CPU extensions. So most Android platforms use ARM architecture. And uh, ARM architecture has trust zone security extensions. Then there is also a secure element on the SIM. So all the phones have SIM card, and this SIM card has secure element which is used by network operators to store uh, cryptographic keys which are used for uh, network authentication. Then there is secure element on micro SD card. Um, this secure element can be plugged to the phone if the phone has micro SD uh, slot. And uh, there is also embedded secure element on NFC chip and it is available on all NFC enabled devices. Uh, so when we have closer look to this uh, uh, trusted execution environments. Um, we find out that not all of them can be really used for our application. For instance, ARM Trust Zone, uh, although it is uh, presented on most of the devices, uh, it is controlled by uh, device manufacturers. It means that if we want to run our code in it, it has to be signed by the uh, device manufacturer. And it's very obviously hard to get in, right? And uh, even worse, there is no uh, APIs available or exposed to the applications so that they cannot access uh, this type of trusted execution environment. There is also a secure element and it is controlled by network operators. So if we want to run our code there, then we have to get, get it signed by network operators. 
and uh, there is also uh, embedded secure element on NFC chip. It is also controlled by device manufacturers, but uh, fortunately it has a pre-installed applet, which is already installed by the manufacturer, and it uh, implements functionality of MyFair Classic card, and MyFair Classic uh, is a standard which is used for access control systems, and it could be used in our application. Although there is also an issue is that uh, my hair classic um, has known to have some weaknesses and it was already uh, replaced. Uh, in many use cases it is, uh, it is getting replaced by more secure schemes like my hair desfire and my hair desfire ev1. Uh, but still many systems, many access control systems rely on my hair classic cards. And there is also a uh, secure element on SD card, and this secure element is freely programmable, and this is actually a good thing. Because if you want to run our code there, we don't have to ask anyone for the permission. So another issue is, are there um, APIs for using secure elements? How easy is that to write your application and say, hey, we use now a secure element? Uh, there are APIs which allow to access uh, uh, embedded secure element on NFC chip and secure element on the SD card. And uh, so there is a uh, open mobile API provided by Seek for Android open source project. Uh, and uh, uh, this API is integrated in uh, uh, Android images by many manufacturers by, defa by default. And there is also NFC private IP, which can provide uh, access to the uh, secure element on the NFC chip. Uh, uh, so the secure element on the SD card can be accessed via open mobile app API. However, uh, unfortunately, although the code is there in the uh, Android image, it is disabled by default to access this type of the secure element. Uh, so we can use it, but to enable access, we have to patch operating system. Uh, so uh, embedded secure element on NFC chip can be accessed via NFC private API or over open mobile API. Uh, but uh, access over NFC private API is uh, possible only by Google signed applications. So the application must have Google signature and then it can use this interface. And we obviously, we are not going to have the signature over our uh, If you want to use open mobile API, uh, to access secure element on NFC chip. Uh, uh, here there is a access control which uh, controls which application uh, can access the secure element. And uh, the access control is realized via uh, access control list which is stored somewhere in the uh, operating system and can be modified only by um, uh, by processes which run with uh, root privileges, with system privileges. Uh, so if you want to have our application running on this uh, secure environment, we have to have root access to add signature of our application to this access control list. So as you see, there is no easy way. But we hope that in future, Actually, this goes uh, in that direction, that uh, the interface for SD card will be enabled by default in future releases of Android. And also considering uh, the fact that uh, it provides possibility to run uh, any code uh, in the secure environment, uh, we consider it as the best choice to uh, use for our architecture. So we used uh, Geekin Deviant Mobile Security Card 
which look, looks like here. And um, actually, it is a standard Java card with, which can run Java applets. And we had to develop uh, key to share secure uh, code as a Java applet. Then uh, we also have another option. We realized or instantiated our uh, trusted execution environment in software. For that, we leveraged the security architecture, which provides uh, uh, lightweight domain isolation on Android. The framework is called Bistrust. And in initially, it was thought uh, or was developed to provide uh, domain isolation for uh, private and for business use. So one device can be used for private and business, and this architecture takes care that uh, applications from those different domains, they don't interfere with each other. So I would like to say several words how this architecture works. Uh, this slide illustrates basic uh, Android, uh, let's say, stack, usually represented by, by kernel layer, middleware, and application layer. And when two applications on Android communicate, they usually use inter-process communication. Uh, so uh, one application issues uh, inter-process communication call, and this call is subject for Android mandatory access control, uh, which resides in the middleware layer, and this um, a reference monitor basically verifies if applications A has sufficient per, uh, permissions to access application B. Uh, but there are also um, other ways for applications to communicate. For instance, one application can write a file and another can read it, or they can establish network uh, sockets and establish communica communication over this socket. And uh, access to file system and network sockets in Android is controlled by discretionary access control uh, mechanism, which is inherited from Linux. Uh, so what Bistras does here, uh, it colors uh, private and corporate apps in different colors, let's say red and green. And it adds mandatory access control on each uh, of these communication channels and enforces isolation. So it says if the application is red, it can never communicate to the application which is green. So we use this architecture to establish trusted execution environment for our case. So here we see two domains. One domain is corporate green, another private red. And we establish one more domain, let's say blue, uh, where we put our uh, key, to, key to share secure application. And we configure access control of Bistrust to allow uh, only key to share application to talk to this blue domain. So regarding protocol security, uh, we used well-established cryptographic primitives as IAS, SHA-1, RSA, and uh, we provide security, formal security proofs of our protocols and also formal tool-aided verification. I don't want to explain you much details about that, yeah, a lot of crypto, but I would like to introduce you in a very high level what our protocols do just for you to understand how the system works. So uh, in the user registration protocol, uh, the, uh, first we assume that the issuer uh, gives one-time password or activation code to the user via out-of-band channel. So if it is employee, it can be a welcome letter saying, uh, um, dear user, welcome to our company, you have uh, you have to get access to our key to share service and your uh, authentication credentials are like this. So this is kind of activation code. Uh, the same can be done in other scenarios as well. And uh, then the user uses this uh, one-time password or activation code to re register on the server and uh, 
During this authentication, the issuer first verifies what are the properties of the platform of the user. Do, does the user have trusted execution environment? Does it has, have execution environment in software or in hardware, or does it have at all? And after properties are verified, uh, the issuer uh, uh, issues uh, authentication secret, uh, which will be used uh, further on to authenticate this particular user, so the user doesn't need to know credentials anymore. So the key issuing here, the user downloads. Uh, so this protocol is for downloading the keys from uh, the issuer. Here the user uh, authenticates based on his authentication key. Uh, and then the issuer sends the token. Token is actually a key, but it is uh, enveloped into the uh, yeah, specific format. And this token is uh, encrypted under the key which is shared. Uh, it is a key shared by the issuer and the resource basically by the door, and this uh, token cannot be decrypted by any other entity, also by the user. So it ensures that uh, whenever the user uh, transfers uh, the token, uh, if there is some adversary who can intercept that, it cannot uh, decrypt it. Then the issuer also sends authentication key and delegation key, and they will be used later on in uh, uh, authentication. And uh, yeah. So next, user authentication protocol. Here the user sends, submits the token he received in the previous protocol to the resource. And uh, this token is encrypted, as I mentioned, by the key shared by the resource and the issuer. And this token includes also authentication key of the user. So when the resource receives this token, it can extract this authentication key, and then the user has to prove that it is in possession of this key, yeah? So the token receives first the authentication key and then the user has to, they run challenge response protocol to verify if the user knows this key. So I think I have to uh, go a bit faster, maybe I skip uh, other protocols because I'm a bit running of time. So I just wanted to say that we have three different implementations for Android. One is based on hardware-based uh, trust execution environment, second based on pstrust extensions, and uh, in the third one we didn't use, uh, we just used embedded uh, security mechanisms for, for Android. Uh, so we implemented uh, key to share secure as a separate Android applications, and we used uh, standard uh, methods like process isolation and private directory of the application to protect the cryptographic keys. So it is like a less secure approach, of course, but uh, it is compatible with any platform. It doesn't require any modifications, not, neither in software or in hardware. So work in progress and challenges. Uh, very important issue is backward compatibility to existing access control solutions. And uh, most existing control solutions in companies, they use smart cards. So we want to be compatible to MyFair, for instance, right? Then we cannot expect the user or, I don't know, all the company uh, to immediately deploy a smartphone-based access control solution because not every user may have Android phone, right? Also with NFC. I think that some users will use, want to use still the card, and some other users who have Android phones with NFC would use access uh, the solution based on Android, right? So this is why we are working now uh, with Bosch security systems, uh, which uh, have uh, access control solutions, their solution matrix. We are working on integration. And another challenge, I would say, is smartphone in card emulation mode. Uh, 
so we often get a question what happens when the device gets discharged, right? The battery is empty, can I enter my office? No, you cannot, unfortunately. Uh, and the reason is that Android doesn't provide a card emulation mode by default. Uh, so usually when we have the card, the card doesn't need power for authentication because card is powered by the uh, electromagnetic field of the reader. So if we use Android in uh, card emulation mode, this problem could be solved. But unfortunately, uh, in the current situation, at current uh, state, uh, card emulation in Android can be enabled only by patching uh, kernel by, uh, yeah. So there is no easy way to enable this. But other platforms like Nokia, BlackBerry provide card emulation. So this, I am finished. Thank you very much. And I, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.